Good morning. We're back in our study of the book of Daniel, looking at what it means to be a reformed person living in an unreformed world. And when we last left Daniel and his friends, we saw they had been taken as captives. They were part of a wave of exiles that were deported from Jerusalem into Babylonia. They had been taken into exile because God allowed the Babylonians to conquer the Israelites. And in doing that, the Babylonians took the best and the brightest out of Jerusalem and took them to Babylon in the hopes of making them Babylonians. God's plan for his people during the course of the exile was clearly laid out through the prophet Jeremiah. God spoke in Jeremiah 29 verses 4 to 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This was God's instruction to Daniel and his friends, along with the rest of the exiles, as they were being taken into Babylon. They were to settle there. They were to build houses. They were to plant gardens. They were to pray for the pagan city of Babylon. They were to seek its peace and prosperity. So what God is telling them is don't separate yourself from the Babylonians. Don't go off and live in huddles together in monastery, but be part of the life of the city. Work for its good, but don't ever assimilate and become like the Babylonians. You're different. That's what God means when he tells them to increase in number. While seeking and working for the good of the city, they were to maintain their distinct identity as the people of God. They were to make sure they didn't lose that. Because a day was coming when God would send them back from Babylon to Jerusalem for their Messiah to finally come. In chapter 1, we saw that Daniel and his friends were taken with the purpose of training them to be useful assets to the kingdom of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's hope for them is they'll become loyal subjects of his kingdom and they'll serve him well in various positions there in the kingdom. In chapter 1, we saw very heavy pressure applied to these young men to begin to assimilate into the Babylonian culture and ways to try to make them forget their heritage as the people of God and become Babylonians. Their names were changed. They were taught things that were in an effort to try to undo everything they knew growing up. What they knew to be truth, what their worldview was, was under attack. The Babylonians were seeking to change it to a Babylonian worldview. But in spite of all the efforts to indoctrinate, in spite of all the assimilation that they tried to impose upon Daniel and his friends, these men remained faithful to God even as they faithfully served Nebuchadnezzar. And in doing that, I think we see here a model, a pattern for how we remain faithful to God, even in times where we face tremendous pressure to conform to the culture we live in. Daniel and his friends were in the world. They learned the ways of the Babylonians. They sought the prosperity of the city they were in, but they never adopted their worldview. They remained obedient to God, even in the face of immense pressure to conform to Babylonian ways. What was it that allowed them to do that? We don't know for sure, but last week I made a point of telling you Daniel and what the name Daniel meant and, and the impact I think his parents must have had on him as they gave him this name. In, in Daniel's day, names weren't picked because they were unusual or cute. They had meaning. They were picked as a means of shaping and defining what you hoped your child would be. Your name very much was your identity. 
Do you think Daniel's parents would give him a name like God is my judge and not be dedicated to teaching Daniel what that meant for the way he lived his life? The only way Daniel and his friends could survive what was going to happen to them and keep their faith intact as it was under assault was because early on their parents had instilled upon them what we would call today a biblical worldview. That's what allowed them to be in the world, but not of the world. From an early age, they had been taught to fear God. They had been taught to obey God. They had been taught that God was their judge, the one they were accountable to. And that became part of the fabric of their life and informed the way they saw life and thought about life. If you're a parent, I want you to know this this morning. It is vitally important for you to be instilling a biblical worldview into your children and to start now, even at an early age. If a parent does this job well, when the time comes, they can send their child out into the world, out into a pagan culture that's hostile to their faith, and that child won't cave into the culture, but will rather influence the culture for the cause of Christ. Our children should be learning about evolution and the arts and communism and socialism and capitalism, but they should be learning them in a biblical world view that's firmly in place and through which they can filter everything that they're learning. If you as a parent are just turning your children over to the school system or over to TV or the internet or their phone, those things are going to be catechizing your children. You have to speak truth into the life of your children. You have to be personally involved in praying and working to shape a Christian worldview in your children, or it is not going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, if you don't do that, you will lose your children to the culture. I'm oftentimes very hard on the church, and I, I think rightfully so. The church hasn't been all that it ought to be especially in the last decades. But the reason why so many young people today are walking away from their faith isn't just because of the church. Much of the responsibility lies with the failure of parents to instill in their children a biblical worldview. To do exactly what the book of Deuteronomy exhorts parents to do, Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 to 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That's what it looks like to instill a biblical worldview in your child. You spend time with your children, and as you do that, you weave God's word and a love for God into the actions of your life and into the discourse of conversation you're having with your child. So often we're so busy just running our children everywhere, working hard to buy them all this stuff that they think they need in order to fit in with their friends. But how much time are we spending talking to them about what's really, really important, helping to shape a Christian worldview? Do you know why Daniel and his friends survived? this onslaught against their faith? It was because their parents, in spite of adversity, their city they lived in was under siege, had apparently done everything they could to instill in their children a biblical worldview. So when their children were taken by force from their home, their faith stood firm. Their parents instilled in their children a fear of God that would control their actions and control their lives in a pagan culture. So even as they were forced into that culture, their faith stood strong. And God then was able to use them to be influencers. I wanna challenge you today to do that with your children. Invest what precious little time you have with them, teaching them what's really important in life. Teaching them to love the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and strength teaching them to live life in a way that directs love outward toward their neighbors so that Christ is shown through their lives. 
It is love for God that must direct every step of a child's life, and the way that they live life. And when that is done, they will be equipped to go out into the world and influence it. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, that's great advice. I wish I had heard that 20 years ago. My kids are grown. They're out the door. But I want you to know this. It's not too late. If you really believe what the Bible teaches about God and life and heaven and hell, there's nothing more important than continuing, even in adulthood, to help your children and their children see the world in a biblical way, to have conversations, to continually pray for them, to encourage them to seek God, to hold on to their faith, or to grab hold of faith and see it as the pearl of greatest price. I believe that's why Daniel and his friends were, were able to endure all that they endured in Babylon and hold on to faith. Now, before we move on to today's passage from Daniel 2, think about this. Think about what Daniel and his friends have been trained in Babylon to do. It's in the context of what I just read a moment ago. They have been trained with the magicians, the astrologers, the enchanters, the wizards of the day, if you will. It's kind of like Harry Potter going to Hogwarts. In their three years of training, they learned all the ways of the Babylonian magicians and enchanters. They learned how to read the stars and how to divine the will of the gods through doing things like examining the entrails of animals, reading tea leaves. They learned all of that, and they actually excelled at it. Daniel learned this material so well that he rose to the highest levels, but he did it all as a committed believer to the true and living God. You see, he learned about things that he didn't necessarily believe in, but he understood those things and sought to understand those things, but see them through a biblical worldview rather than the Babylonian worldview. This is the life each of us are called to. We're not called to go huddle up and live in a monastery somewhere and be secluded from the world. We also aren't called to assimilate into the world and become just like it, and go along with everything they do and think. Jesus has called us to go and be salt and light. That means we have to be out in the world, interacting with the world, but holding on to a biblical worldview, holding on to our faith. If we separate from the world, if we put the light under a bowl, then we're doing just exactly what Jesus told us not to do. And if we assimilate with the world, the light soon goes out. We have nothing to offer. Daniel is a bright light shining in the midst of a pagan culture. He engaged and excelled in learning the ways of the Babylonians, but he did it for a different reason. He did it for the glory of God. He didn't do it to get ahead. He did it to be that light shining in the darkness. And if you're a Christian, this is the life you're called to. We need to always remember this. Daniel didn't end up in exile in Babylon by accident. It was part of God's plan. He was there for a purpose, and that purpose is to influence Nebuchadnezzar and the following kings, who were the most powerful kings of the day. And he does that seeking, Daniel does that seeking to excel at everything to bring glory to God. Now, listen to how this begins to play itself out in chapter 2. Let me read to you this morning from verses 1 to 28. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled. He could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to his astrologers, this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream. 
we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I'm certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there's only one penalty for you. You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among the humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You've given me wisdom and power. You've made known to me what we have asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man from among the exiles of Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar that which will happen in the days to come. In these first 28 verses of Daniel 2, what do we see Daniel doing? Well, what we really see him doing is living out Paul's exhortation in Colossians 3, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God, giving thanks to God the Father. Let's think about whatever it is that Daniel's doing here. Can, can you imagine the most powerful king in the world summoning you into his court, not only to tell him the meaning of a dream, but also tell him what the dream was? And by the way, to be under a threat that if you can't do that, you'll be executed. If you remember your Bible, and I'm sure most of you do, this scene in Babylon is kind of similar to a scene that played out 1,500 years earlier with Joseph and Pharaoh in Egypt. There's a striking similarity between the two accounts. Both involve young men forcibly being taken from their homeland put in a position by God in which they're able to shape and influence powerful kings and cultures. Both involve kings having dreams about the future. Pharaoh was deeply troubled by his dream, but he couldn't remember it. And he insisted that his wise men also tell him what the dream was and tell him the interpretation. In this passage, we don't know if the case was Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream like Pharaoh. I think in the context, it's more likely Pharaoh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly what the dream was, but he wanted to see if his wise men were really that wise. Anybody could give an interpretation, 
but only someone who truly was a wise man and could see into the future and understand mysteries would be able to tell the king what his dream was. Daniel 2.9, the king warns the wise men if they don't tell him the dream, he's going to put them to death. And he says, look what he says at the end of verse 9, so then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The wise men understand the impossible situation Nebuchadnezzar's put them in. They're about to be exposed as being the frauds that they are. They were probably very learned men and knew a lot about a lot of things, but they didn't know mysteries that were impossible to know unless God revealed them because they didn't know God. In verses 10 to 11, they talk about how impossible it is, how difficult it is. Then no one can do this except the gods, and the gods don't live among the humans. Daniel even echoes that same thinking in verse 27. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries that he's asked about. Now, notice the ellipse at the end of that, the dots. Daniel says just a little more than that. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, just think about what's at stake. This is a seemingly impossible situation. The lives of all the wise men, all the enchanters and wizards are at stake, even Daniel and his friends. Daniel, as I reminded you at the beginning, had excelled in learning all the ways of the Babylonians, but he knows in the face of a situation like this that all their ways are worthless and hopeless. The Babylonians realize that too. The Babylonian worldview has left them completely empty and without answers. Very similar, I think, to the culture we live in today. But God put a young man with a biblical worldview into place in the king's court in Babylon to show the difference between a Babylonian worldview and a biblical worldview. To show the empty power of the gods of Babylon compared to the surpassing greatness of Yahweh, Daniel's God the God of Israel. Before going into how Daniel deals with this seemingly impossible situation, do you see an application here for your life? Wherever you are in life, whether you're in business, whether you're at a hospital working, whether you're in a government position, whether you're in school, whether you're retired, God has put you there for a purpose, to be light in the darkness, to influence and shape the culture you live in. In whatever impossible situation you find yourself in, God has put you there in that situation so that his light and glory and power can shine through your life. God has put you just where you are for a time such as this. Remember what Paul wrote, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. If you're a Christian, you must realize that wherever God's put you, he's put you there for his glory, his purpose. He's put you where you are to show the difference between having a biblical worldview and a common, ordinary, everyday worldview. Daniel is one of a large group of astrologers and enchanters and magicians and wizards, but he's different from that large group. He's different because his worldview is different and he knows where to go to find answers to impossible situations. And if you're a Christian, don't you know that too? Daniel knows the answer to impossible situations. It doesn't lie in the stars. It doesn't lie in the livers of sheep or tea leaves. It lies in God. So what does Daniel do? Verses 17 and 18. He returns to his house and he asks his friends to plead with God for mercy and answers concerning this mystery. In one sense, what Daniel and his friends are doing is very much a last resort. If this doesn't work, they'll be dead. There's no other options other than to turn to God for answers. But in another sense, it very much is their first resort. It's the go-to response for Dave. He doesn't try a bunch of other things first to see if they'll work. He goes right to prayer. It's a first and a last resort. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul makes it very clear that we're in an impossible situation too, just like Daniel. Our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Brothers and sisters, if you think you can stand on your own against those forces, you're sadly mistaken. Prayer is your first and last resort. It's your only resort. We're engaged in a fight that we could never win in our strength against these dark forces. An impossible fight. A fight that's unwinnable unless we cry out to God for mercy and help, like Daniel did. And just like Daniel, in a sense, prayer is our last resort our only resort, but it also should be the first resort, the only thing we do. Now look what Paul teaches us right after he talks about how impossible our fight is. Look what he says in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. How do we win this fight against the powerful forces that are arrayed against us, these dark forces in the spiritual realm? We do the same thing Daniel did. We pray to God. We cry out for mercy. We should always be praying in moments of desperation, but not just in those moments. Prayer shouldn't just be a last resort when everything else has failed. It should be our first resort. It should be proactive, not just reactive. If we look at the world rightly and understand the battle we're engaged in, in other words, if we have a correct worldview, every moment we live in is desperate. Lives are hanging in the balance. If we saw the spiritual warfare going on all around us, We'd be so scared, we'd be constantly on our knees in prayer. Using prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie to call in heavenly resources to help us in the fight. But so often we're oblivious to the battle that rages on around us in the spiritual realms. Every day there are lives we are interacting with that are literally hanging in the balance. We can't wish people into the kingdom of Christ, even though that should be the desire of our heart for them. We can't get them into the kingdom through our efforts and our own hard work, although we ought to be working hard to do that. The only effective thing we can do for them is to get on our knees and pray and plead with God for mercy because only God can take dead spiritual bones and bring them back to life. It's kind of funny how all this works. Not Funny, haha, ha, but funny in a strange sort of way. When a person's physical life is hanging in the balance and they're at death's door, then we pray, we plead with God for mercy. We feel an intense motivation, rightly so, to do that. But when their spiritual life is hanging in the balance, like so many lives are all around us, we don't tend to feel that same sense of urgency. A right biblical worldview would tell us that as important as physical life is, the spiritual well-being of the people all around us is far more important. The only way the spiritual forces are arrayed against us and our families and our church and our community and our nation is going to be undone, is going to be through God's mercy, unleashed through the power of prayer. Prayer for all things, on all occasions. That's what Paul tells us. In verse 18, what else does he say, though? Always keep on praying. You don't just fire up a prayer and then you're done with it. You continually beseech the Lord and cry out for mercy until God brings you an answer. Sometimes we give up on situations and people far too easily. God calls us to pray continually for his mercy to be poured out on those around us even into the most hopeless of situations, because God delights in pouring out his power and mercy through the prayers of his people. He's inviting us to share in the glory story, giving us the opportunity to pray for God to do what only God can do. 
when we in our weakness realize all we can do is cry out for God for mercy, do you realize what we're really doing? We're giving God all the glory for whatever happens. Now look what Daniel does when God answers his prayer. Daniel gives praise to God before he does anything else. Daniel reminds himself that all this isn't from him and what he's done, but from God. Verses 19 to 23. The vision, the mysteries revealed to him. And Daniel, what does he do at the end of verse 19? He praises the God of heaven. Verse 20, and said, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God, and my ancestors. You've given me wisdom and power. You've made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream." of the king, Daniel is getting ready to go and meet with the most powerful man in the world, a man who could take his life like that. And through God's power, Daniel has gotten the information the king's looking for, not just the interpretation of the dream, but the dream itself. You know, I, I think about what Daniel does here, and I think about myself and my own life, and I wonder what I would have done at this moment, this eureka moment where I understood the dream and knew what the dream was if I was in Daniel's shoes. You know, I have to think, knowing me the way I know me, I'd have run straight into the palace to get an attaboy from the king for what I had done. But Daniel's different. What does he do before he goes to the king? He stops and he gives God the glory for what God has done. Why is this so important? Well, for one thing, it's the right thing to do, right? God's given him an answer before he does anything else. Daniel thanks God for the answer and gives him praise. But even more than that, do you realize what this does? This fixes firmly in Daniel's heart and mind that it's God who has done this and not Daniel. He is prepared now to go into the king and give God all the glory. You cannot proclaim the glory of God to others unless the glory of God is first fixed in your own heart. You can't be a light for Christ unless the light of Christ is illuminating your life. You cannot commend to others what you do not cherish first in your own heart. So always take time to give thanks to God and praise to God for all that he's done for you as he moves and answers prayer. In your own heart, give God the glory first, then you'll be ready to go and proclaim his glory to others. Now, what do we see once Daniel has done that, and fixed the glory of God in his own heart, then Daniel's ready to go and tell the king not just the dream and what the dream means, but more importantly, how it is God alone who's enabled Daniel to do what no one else could do. Daniel makes sure God gets the glory. Look what Daniel does before he tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream and its meaning. Verses 27 to 28, Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen <clears throat> in the days to come. Now, We'll get into the dream and its interpretation next week. This week, would you just notice this? Notice Daniel's words. There is a God in heaven. Every time we find ourselves in a hard, impossible situation, we have to understand that there is a sovereign God in heaven who has placed us there to proclaim God's glory to a watching world to proclaim to the world that there is a God in heaven. People should look at us in the midst of the struggles and see us process things and live differently because we know there's a God in heaven who's in control of this. Imagine if we were more like Daniel, more willing to put our faith on the line. What if when trouble came up at work, our first response would be to tell our co-workers that we're gonna go and pray? and ask God for wisdom and help and mercy. 
That'd be putting our faith out there, wouldn't it? Can you imagine yourself doing that in your work situation? But imagine the impact that might have on your coworkers when they see God move and answer your prayers. Now, like I said, we're not going to go into the dream and its meaning this week, but you know how the story ends. It ends with Daniel being praised. Verse 47, the king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. This is Daniel's God. This is our God. Do you realize that's why you're put here on earth? Do you realize that's why God has saved you? Do you realize that's why God allows you to be put in every single hard situation you may find yourself in? It is so that the world can see through your life that our God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. I once had a seminary professor who used to say, atheists don't pray because they're afraid if they pray, God might show up. And Christians don't pray because they're afraid if they pray, God might not show up. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think a lot of times we're afraid to pray boldly because even though we say we have faith in God, we're not really convinced when the moment comes our God is going to show up. But when we allow that feeling to linger in our subconscious and inhibit our prayer life, then you know what we're really doing? We're making Jesus out to be a liar. Look what Jesus said in John 15, 7, 8. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. What is Jesus saying? Pray, pray. Pray in my name and God will show up and answer your prayers because God wants to pour his power out through the lives and the prayers of his people. And based on what Jesus is telling us there, there's only three things we have to do to ensure the, the reality that God will indeed show up when we pray. First, we have to remain in Jesus. The power of our prayers isn't in us and what we say or how we say it. The power of our prayers is that they're prayed in Jesus' name. We don't come to God and make our requests in our own righteousness with our own flowery prayers. We come in the name of Jesus. Second, Jesus said his word must remain in us. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that we must be radically seeking to align the purpose and will of our life with the will of Christ being obedient to his commands. So as you think about how do we pray and pray boldly, let me just ask you this. Do you think it's any doubt that it is God's will that our young children would grow up to know God and to walk with God? We should pray to that end. Do you have any doubt that it's God's will that our young adults contemplating marriage would have a marriage that reflects Christ and would have Christ at the center of their marriage we should pray boldly to that end for them. Do you have any doubt that it's God's will that God would want our young adults who are starting a career, starting out in life, to find a career in which they can excel and bring glory to Christ? We should pray to that end. Do you have any doubt that it's God's will that the eyes of our teenagers would be open through this Ark Encounter trip that we're about to go on, that they would see a biblical worldview and embrace it, we should be praying boldly to that end. Do you have any doubt that it's God's will that the power and curse of sin in the world would be broken in the lives of people so that they become worshipers of God? We should pray to that end. Do you have any doubt that God would want a revival to happen here at Foothills that would spread out from this church to the community around us? We should pray boldly to that end. All we have to do is ask in the name of Jesus. And we can ask with confidence because to paraphrase what Paul says in Romans 8.32, if God has loved us enough to give us his own son, will he not along with Jesus give us everything else that we need for our good and for the sake of his glory? Ask boldly in prayer and expect God to do great things. Make prayer not just your last resort.
but your first resort. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, the revealer of mysteries. We are your people. Our times are in your hands. Help us to look and see the cross and the reality of what you've done for us, giving us your son, and realize that as your children, we can now come boldly to the throne of heaven to seek help in our time of need and all the things that besiege us. Father, would you give us a worldview that doesn't see things the way our world sees it, but sees it through the eyes of Jesus. And we ask this in Christ's name.